The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by the Elite Experience Elite Shotguns and is fueled by Fioki. Oh. Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast, coming in hot with everything you want to hear about sporting clays. Guy Fieri. How are you, gentlemen? Thanks for having me. Anthony Batteries Jr., how you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. Welcome back, David Radulovic. That's a net positive. <laughs> Brad Kidd. Corey Cruz. Thank you for joining us this evening. Now I feel awkward. With your hosts, Jason Rambo. One more Red Bull for you. And Sean Alley. Woo, yeah! Christmas. Do it. Often imitated, but never duplicated. It's the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. And now, it's showtime. Well, Mr. Large and in charge. This is a weird one. Did you ever think in a million years we would have a national champion, a world champion, and an Olympian sitting right next to us in the studio? Oh, yeah, and then there's Chad. Who the hell is that? Oh, that's Chad Roberts. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Who invited that guy? Yeah. Right. Welcome, Derek Mine and Chad Roberts. What's up, fellas? Not much. Doing fine all the time with Derek Mine. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so we got lucky catching you guys on your way out to the Northeast Regional. Say, uh, we were trying to hook up last night. This is a morning podcast for those of you who wanted to know. This is uh, definitely a different uh, approach. So we're all in here a little bit bleary eyed trying to get the ball rolling. Yeah, a little. That reserve looks really good, though. Uh, well, that's like I said, <laughs> you come back for an evening podcast yeah, and we'll crack that one open. That would be really bad <laughs> driving down the freeway. Hey, we do have attorney talk we got to get to real quick, Sean Alley. It's tourney talk. <laughs> Brought to you by Score Chaser. All right, guys, the 2024 Texas State is open for registration April 16th through the 21st, 2024 at Greater Houston Sports Club. Uh, GH also moved their Diamond Classic September 21st to the 24th, 2023 to Score Chaser. Both of those are open now. Uh, get on it and get registered now. Um, Derek, you mentioned, because we were going to try and do this on your way back through since the way the schedule worked out, but you mentioned you were going up to a selection match in Michigan. What? Explain now how that works. So uh, we have two selection matches a year for USA Shooting okay. to uh, pick the national team as well as who is going to travel in team slots to the World Cups, World Championships, uh, Pan American Games. And this one is especially big. It uh, It's the second half of the selection process for the 2023 World Championship team, the Pan American team, but it's also the first half of the Olympic trials. Oh, wow. Very cool. Um, last year at the Nationals, you showed me – that medal you had brought home and it has not hit our shores for decades. Explain to everybody what that was, if you don't mind. So uh, I won the ISSF men's trap world championship and uh, an American had not won that since 1966. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> it's a little bit way in the ways back machine. Remember the, the video? Yes. I that, remember uh, that we did for you. Cause you weren't there. Yeah, And thank you, you for doing that, that, by the you way. You had I that gold you. medal. That's what he's talking about. There. That's very cool. So. Well, what was cool about that is I haven't actually seen the match yet. Till yesterday, oh. when we're driving down the road, and uh, I was like, and I'm, you know, me, I have to know the ending, and you know, like when we talk about races, like who won? He's like, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you, you got to watch it. You're, you're three hours ahead, and tell me what happened. <laughs> um, but Derek's like, just watch it. And I'm like, all right, and it was funny because he was he's he was driving, and then all of a sudden he was like, yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times, and he wasn't really excited. And about halfway through it, he's like, put that phone up on the dash let's watch this as we're going down the freeway but uh he did some funny things at the end of the match that i i talked to diana his wife about it and she <laughs> said she pretty much wore a hole in her floor walking back and forth and she was gonna kill him <laughs> and he had other friends of his that shot uh that shoot that in in bunker um all the u.s team um Army guys were sitting yelling at the TV, calling them some great names. <laughs> so, if you guys ever want to see something really just crazy, gut wrenching, and amazing, uh, watch that because the last, what was it, the last five shots? No, it was the last three of the semifinals. Yeah. So, he's leading the semifinals by a lot. Really? <laughs> he was just unbelievable fast and. You know, and you know, of course, me, I'm critiquing his style and like how he mounts. I'm like, what are you doing here? What are you doing there? <laughs> right. And he's just pounding the targets. And then, uh, he, uh, he actually, he, I was like, what the heck happened there? Cause he missed the target and it was the last three shots. So mm -hmm. he missed one. And I'm like, eh, 
And he didn't say anything, just smiling at me on the, you know, going down the road. And then he missed the next one. I was like, okay, what's going on here, dude? And he missed his last target. And that brought him into a tie. Oh, geez. That he had to do a shoot off in a tie. Oh. And, uh, and he was, and he knew the kid he had to shoot off with. And, uh, he, he said he knew at one point, you know, the target that the kid missed, he was going to miss because he was shooting a high rib. And, um, yes, yeah, see, I just said I shot a high rim. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> he's like, this target, he's not going to be able to hit. And he, he actually missed it. Wow. And, um, but he thought he had it in the bag because he wasn't, he was such in the zone mm-hmm. as some people, you know, we talk about that here a couple times before oh, yeah. years, yeah, you know, maybe about, once or twice. Yeah, yeah. About being in the zone. Well, he was such in the zone. He thought he had it covered. He didn't realize they were as close as they were. So he actually missed those. I wouldn't say on purpose, but no. Um, so the, the guy that I ended up shooting off with, I had hit my 22nd target. I was 22 straight and the horn honked when he shot and he, he had already missed three. Well, he had actually hit that target. He, he, he puffed it and it, not saying he didn't hit it. He yeah, he, it was a review. You it, it. They reviewed it. He he hit it, mm-hmm. um, but it never registered in my mind because I had looked at the scoreboard before they corrected the scoreboard, and I only had three targets to shoot, and I was up by four on the scoreboard. Oh no! <laughs> and it, you know how weird stuff happens. Yeah, you know you. I'm not proud to admit it, but my brain checked out. Like, all right, I won the Olympic quota. I'm already moving on, and. I did not have the same drive to shoot those three targets that I did the other 50 some targets I shot in the file. You said your your brain checked out. And see, I can relate because that happens to me on the first pair of every tournament and for the rest of the day I'm not there. <laughs> so, Dude, you do it, right? You do it here. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um well Chad, I mean, let's talk about you for a second. Um I mean, you've been shooting pretty well lately, so I know you've, better. you've been yeah. doing a lot of training, a little practicing. Um, yeah, you know, it, we'll, we could talk about that. I did have one more I'm, question. I'm glad you didn't watch him shoot last week. Oh, 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 really? <laughs> no, no, wait. No, no, we'll, let's go we'll, into that, Derek. We'll, we'll, we'll get there, but really, really quick, because I had two things. I want to make sure people understand what, what that meant with what Derek did. So he kind of let off the gas because he thought he had it won, right? And it, 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 the funny thing is, if you watch the video, watch his coach, Jay. This guy's more animated than I am. I mean, he is shaking his fist. He's no. Like his head's between his legs. I mean, this guy is, he is, he probably was over 200 with blood pressure. He was, he was jacked. And it was hilarious because all he said to him is, you got this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all he could say. Like, yeah, he, he yeah, was, those. I, Let's just say if I had a dollar for everybody that told me that I gave them a heart attack, I'd be a very wealthy man. Wow. Wow. So, so, you know, what I think people may not understand because it's so different. You know, I've raced, I've done the Olympic stuff, you know, with BMX and I understand how that works. So what did it mean? Can you explain to the listeners about the 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 quota, what the real reason you guys were there. It, it, there's, there's a couple of reasons why people shoot. Obviously they want to win and stuff like that. So, you know, world championships, gold medals, bronze, silvers, whatever. Um, you, you were working for a quota and what does that mean? So for the USA to send someone to the Olympic games, we have to win an Olympic quota. Okay. And that is a spot, a starting spot in the Olympic games. Um, and we haven't had one for a long time, right? We in we, the in the singles trap. Yeah, we we got we took gold and silver at the Pan Am Games last quad to get our two quotas, but we had missed the previous two Olympics to that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so by winning the quota doesn't guarantee me a spot to go to the Olympics. I still have to win our Olympic trials. Okay, um, you know we were we were very fortunate. Will Hinton. He went down to the Continental Championships down in Peru last year, and he won that, which got us our second quota. Uh-huh. Um, you're allowed two in each event. Plus an so, alternate, right? No. No, no, no alternate. alternates in your game? Okay. No. Um, we only take the two. Two. Okay. And uh, so we've got our full boat for men's trap of two two spots. Nice. So at least, you know, there there's a little margin for error, but there's really not. I mean, if you don't finish in the top two, you don't go to the Olympics. And, wow, uh, wow. So, so yeah, you can get the quota and not make not go to which the Olympics. Everybody, everybody always says, Oh, that's not fair, but if it were 
the guys that won the quota got to keep them and go, then I wouldn't have gone to Tokyo. Okay. So um, it's it's a good and a bad system, you mm-hmm. know. But given as deep as the U.S. is in most of the shooting disciplines, you can't really do it like the rest of the world. The rest of the world has three, four guys, and that's all that compete. Yeah. And so if they go in a quota, they get to keep it. Um, in the U.S., we do things more democratically, mm-hmm. and we've got enough guys that are good enough to win quotas that – you know, they might not get the opportunity to go win a quota because we've already won our two. Okay. That's serious, and huh? so once you've got your two quotas, when you go to an event, if your country's full and you take a spot that would have normally won a quota, it passes you up and goes to the next guy. Okay. Hmm. So it, it, it still gives those guys an opportunity to compete in the Olympics through the Olympic trials. Yeah. Sounds like a complicated process, but I, I mean, it makes sense why they do it that way. So. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, you know, it, it makes for it makes for a stressful couple years um, yeah. for sure. But it, it's definitely definitely an exciting process, and it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. How many how many actual events in the trials do you have an opportunity to make that the team? There are two trials, a total of five hundred targets of normal qualification. And then the top six will shoot a super final of an additional 50 targets, all single shot. Wow. So it's 550 targets, and the top two total score go on to the Olympics. That's how hard it is, folks. Wow. That's incredible. It, it, when, when I finished the Olympic trials last time, at that point, that was the hardest thing I had ever done with a shotgun. <laughs> That's incredible. I can't even wrap my head around that. No, not at all. That's crazy. I can't wrap my head around 50 birds of feet task here locally. So <laughs> I, right. I said um, at that time, that was the hardest thing I'd ever done. Then the hardest thing now was winning that world championship. That, really? that was, that was as stressful, especially those, those five sudden death shoot off targets um, to win the quota and move on to the medal round. That was without a doubt, the most Pressure packed targets I've ever shot. In my so life. Did, now on those five targets, did they move you back to the twenty seven or no? There's you shoot from fifteen meters, okay, and and it's a missing out. And really, like in the shoot off, you know what target you're getting. Like yeah, you, you shoot a left and then a right and then a left and a right, and uh, it just alternate through until someone misses. Wow! And you go through the each uh, position too, right? Yeah, you move from mm-hmm. post one to two to three to four, and you just keep rotating through. And um, the about the longest shoot off I personally witnessed was last year in Tokyo for the gold and silver um, between the two Czech guys. They uh, they went like twenty five or twenty six targets, I think, missing out shoot off, um, wow. which was pretty cool to see. the The longest shoot off that I know of was in ninety six between Lance Bade and Josh Lakatos. They went like twenty eight or twenty nine targets. Wow, and Jeez. that was for the silver medal. In and it's Atlanta. and it's not. Like VTAS, Jason, where you get two shots. Yeah, yeah, one. no, I get it's it. One in the in the in those finals and in the in the shootouts. So the way one I sh- shot, a little bit of pressure, the, the way a little I, bit of pressure. The way I shoot, I need something belt fed. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> you still you still might. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Chad. You, you need so you need. I, I'm going to tell you this. Go the I, different directions. I, I, I don't know that you can pull the trigger fast enough to get off more than two shots before the target hits Man, the it, ground. Yeah, wow. so I mean, you're the just. For people that don't realize, in Bunker Trap, the target is somewhere between 62 and 66 miles an hour. Yeah. it The target has to get thrown 76 meters. And now that's compared to Trap, which is at, what, like 53 or 54 or uh, American Trap's like 41 or 2. Oh, is it really that low? Yeah, okay. It's, yeah, I knew it was it's lower. not that fast. Well, we had the privilege or opportunity, whatever you want to call it, to shoot a little bit of Bunker when we were down at... Uh, Oh God! Please don't talk. Oh, please don't go Dude, there. At, at Kaylee Browning's place, and that was an eye-opening experience. You want to talk me. about humbling? So yeah. standing on the line, I think Sean had just made masters, but we were shooting, and I'm not going to say their names because they'll get mad at me. I was the only guy there that was standing on that line. It was in double A. Everybody else was master. I shot. I never shot bunker in my life. I shot a twenty. I was the highest one out of everybody on the line and there was guys on the line that are very well known very good master class shooters that shot like single digits 
Well, when I was at, I mean, so, that's humbling. So when we were out here, speak going back to what you were asking me about my shooting is, uh, you know, I was supposed to come out here last week and or to um, Kansas, and we were going to do a uh, clinic at Powder Creek and a couple day clinic, and then um, Derek called me and said, "Hey, you know, they're having their their club championships, so." Um, we can't do the clinic. And I was like, you know, Jen, as you know, you know, she's like, if you're not making money and teaching, you can't go. Right. <laughs> I was like, well, well, babe, I already bought the ticket and we got to do this. So, um, and it was a good opportunity for me too, because, um, there's, 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 there's a few people that I listen to that have worked with me that I actually can, I, I take real for real, you know, in my heart about what they tell me about my shooting. Anthony's one. Ben's one of them. Um, I just don't get to talk to him that much. And then this guy right here. So um, came out here anyway, and we went to Powder Creek, and it was a disaster. <laughs> but he got to see what I've you been need, struggling so with. So you needed something belt fed. No, it, it was just there was zero, zero connection. I couldn't figure it out. You know, granted, he, I mean. He needed the four bore. Yeah, I needed the four bore for sure. Four bore. Yeah, I needed a 15-foot wide pattern. I still probably would have missed some stuff. You know, and I hadn't shot in the trees for a bit. You know, you could make all kinds of excuses. But the bottom line is it just wasn't happening. And I and, and – is. I guess I could say as embarrassed as I was because I was with a bunch of his friends and Rad Chad, you got that pressure, you're in there, you know, should have been able to put up a big score, you know, all that good stuff. And I wanted to run against him and see how I was going to do because I had been shooting well um, back home. And uh, But at the same time, it, you know, if you're not learning in this game, you're not, yeah, you're exactly. not growing. So Derek got to see what I've been struggling with when it does go wrong. And we were able to check it back in a little bit on the second hundred birds um i shot a whopping 79 on the first you know the first hundred and i was like i don't even know what's going on got some things straightened out he said some stuff to me and i was like okay and it felt better but there was still some things that i i wasn't quite getting um you know and it was just tough but <laughs> backing up a couple days before that he was like hey we're going to the farm and if you guys know what the farm is it's not bobby brooks place and from what i understand the farm to be the farm is uh his dad's place uh, okay is where he grew up gotcha. so the real farm to me is you know rick mines sporting clay course and 800 acres of joy and, <laughs> um, well we roll out there and i'm thinking we were going to do some you know some sporting do some stuff you know because that's what we do nope i got to enjoy 250 rounds a bunker really and i hadn't shot bunker since it's been a bit um it's humbling it, it's very humbling it, especially in tucson it's that place is super hard to shoot and that's where i saw Derek. you know when you won that uh, last year was it last year right when you won that or the year before for the yeah. trials um it had been 2020 when 20. i made the olympic team so that okay and so then this yeah, spring i we had a selection yeah. match out there in yeah, like february got, i think you were you were there this yeah, spring for the for the arizona state or yeah, something like that yeah so i got to watch him not shoot well one day because of wind or whatever and then really bring it back and run it to make it into the final that was pretty cool we went to dinner the night before he was pretty sad um you know because I, I it's so much pressure yeah you know so anyways um I got to shoot bunker, you know, and I got to get back in the game and it, you know, I went, you know, 19, 18, 19, 18, 19, 18. And I finally shot a 22 or 23 on my last one. I finally started connecting with it because he has to pound it in my head what I'm supposed to be saying, you know, and sometimes you just don't want to see it and do it. I didn't um, have a big enough hammer. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was, it was it comes out, but it, it was, it was good. So then we went to his house and we spent the next day, actually mother's day morning, um, that was an unbelievable dinner again um but uh before his parents came over um we went out set targets and shot and uh i learned a lot of stuff like stuff it was pro level nice would you say that pretty pro level stuff that you were kind of working on with me um yeah i i, I don't know I, what you call I, it it's just because it's what i learned is stuff that you don't teach a beginner and, you know, you just can't if they don't have the experience and the understanding. Got the foundation before you Yeah, can. you know, and, and that's probably where my biggest struggle is. We were talking about last night while we were driving is, like, my biggest struggle is, you know, I'm teaching a certain way, which works. And it's very, very, um, you know, I'll put it up against anybody. You know, um, it, it's it's what you need to teach people. But, you know, 
not all of us get, you know, a top competitor, you know, and you're mm. trying to build them, but you don't have one that you're working with. Very right. few, you know, Anthony has a lot of experience with that. Um, you know, Derek keeps to himself. So, you know, I don't think, I think he works with uh, the people he wants to work with. Right. So, um, and you know, I, I had to sit there as a coach and it took me a bit to really understand what he was trying to put down. And, and plus he's, he's working on what he, how he explains some of the stuff that he's trying to quantify. Um, that's a good word to use. Um, so for, for, for people out there, that are wondering what I work with Chad on. I, I help bring him back to his, the basic fundamentals of looking at a target and feeling how everything else has to work together to break the target. Yeah. Um, it's real easy when you're out there coaching to get caught up in the mechanics. And, and when you get focused on the mechanics, you tend to not look at the target correctly. And that's really the nuts and bolts of what I was working with Chad on. Mm -hmm. um, now, but explaining it was right for it, somebody like me that the hammer was needed. You know, okay. just because you get stuck in how you shoot and how you teach, and you shoot bad, and you get te you go to your technical base, and it works. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like reverting sometimes. You know, you, re you you revert to what you know works, and it pulls you. It pulls. It puts the wheels back on the truck. But it doesn't really get it pushed down the freeway very well. Right, okay. it goes. You finish around. You do okay. But you take, I, you know, look. I'm, I'm first to tell you. I, I, I struggle to be. You know, I'm at the top at where I'm at um, on the West Coast. You know, I can compete with anybody out there. But it's different out on tour, and people don't understand that. And if you don't understand it, go shoot a bunch of regionals, and I'll tell you, they'll they'll humble you humble you right now. Mm -hmm. you know? So, Absolutely. so speaking of that. Um, the three of us are headed to the Northeast Regional. Derek, you, you're back and forth between bunker and trap and sporting. So, how do you prepare for like going to the regionals? I mean, what do you what do you do in your training different to kind of bring you back into the whole sporting thing? Um, really, I just go out and and shoot. Like I try and we went out Saturday and shot at Powder Creek, and I didn't shoot great. I shot okay, um, but it's it's more about just time on the range, getting yeah. down the barrel, um, starting to help myself remember what it feels like to make a good move connected with the target. Yeah. And it usually takes me five to 800 targets before I really start getting back in the groove for sporting clays. Yeah. Um, so it's not, I mean, let's, it's not like you forgot, right? right. I mean, you're a national champion, but it's you, you kind of got to get your mind back into yeah this tune of things right and you know like going into the olympic trials last time um i was still shooting probably more sporting clays than i was bunker really um some of that was to do with i didn't have a place to practice i was having to drive to st louis or fort worth to uh to practice bunker so i didn't really practice a lot of bunker mm -hmm. so i was still shooting a lot of sporting clays well my sporting clays game was still really strong well the last, since I got home from Tokyo in August of 21, I've really dedicated myself to working on trap. And so I haven't been practicing sporting clays. And, and last year, my game suffered a lot um, from that. And because I, I wasn't putting the practice time in for sporting and was building my game with bunker. And I felt like I had to get to a spot shooting bunker where I trusted the game, trusted my game and skills no matter what mm -hmm. before I could go back to practicing sporting. Okay. Um, Sean, I know you got a question for Chad, but before you get to that, that just made me think of something. With with trap and bunker, you're you're obviously you're not doing any kind of sustained lead, right? Um, but does it does that play an effect in your sporting game because you're coming from behind on everything with trap and bunker? So does that you kind of got to get out of that mindset? Is that part of the method that you need to get back in tune to? Because you said you you focused a lot on trap and it hurt your sporting game. Is right. that did that have a little something to do with it? Maybe. Yeah, I I wouldn't say that that the trap um, hurt my sporting game. It was the lack of practice. Okay. Of sporting, um, and you know when you're shooting a lot of going away targets especially at the speed of bunker not knowing exactly which angle it's going at and you have to come from behind on a target that's where your mind gets comfortable so i, right. I kind of had to build that into my sporting game a little bit more okay. um so it, it's 
it's more of just trusting what I'm seeing and trusting that my eyes are doing things right. Yeah. And, you know, now that I've kind of got to a point where I'm really comfortable in my bunker game, I feel like I've been able to flip the switch back and forth a little bit better and go back to my preferred style of shooting sporting clays. Um, and that right there, guys, is what I was talking about, what I was working on. That's what I was yeah, trying to get back so, to. So. so it's – this one's a weird one because, you know, you got you got a couple coaches out there that try to science the feel as we talk about all the time. Jason, you know, is like, oh, I'm, you know, that particular coach sciences the crap out of – how to feel a target, what your body's supposed to feel. You got doctors telling you this and that and all that. And you got then the other side of it is, you know, they teach pictures, what it looks like, you know, seeing the barrel, the target and the gap and the picture. And then you got guys that are very technical that, you know, will teach you, you know, how to, you know, create lead, make lead, um, calculate lead, um, know where the gun's at all the time. You know, you have all these different styles out there. Um, I, I would say that myself, I, I, since I teach all the different methods as per se is just a way of talking about forward allowance. Really, it doesn't really matter how you do it because there is no wrong way. However, Derek said one thing to me the other day. He's like, you know, have you ever had somebody stick their finger out and look at a target with their finger? You know, it, it, it's really hard to keep your finger on that target. You're, you're, you're always wanting to be in front you're, of it. Your, your, your finger will go forward, right? Well, if you think about that from a, from a shooting standpoint, and then you are able to keep your eye on the target to bring it into clarity and do all that stuff. If you think about that, what are you really doing? You're looking at the target. You're in sync. You're getting in sync with the target with your eyes and okay. really seeing the target. And what does that mean? Right. And like, I, you know, I ask this stuff all the time and I, I, I have a good understanding of it, but you know, what does it mean to you guys? Like Jason, what does it mean to you to, 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 to see a target? Well, and then I'm going to have Derek tell you what it's supposed to look like. What does it mean to yeah. me to see it How well? do you know that you're seeing a target well? When I obliterate the thing. Okay. What do you think, Derek? I think that's a good answer. That's a good answer, right? I mean, really, if our our hands and our brain and our eyes are working as a team. Mm -hmm. And your hands get their information from the brain. Brain gets the information from the eyes. Well, if your eyes aren't fully locked on the target, they can't give good information to your brain to give to your hands. So to me, if it, my approach to the game is all about eyes first, right? And getting visually locking on the target as early in the flight path as I can. Um, for most targets, like if something coming at you, you don't want to be like laser focused on it when it leaves the trap because you run out of time that you can keep your eyes focused on it. But you got to have your eyes visually locked on the target before it ever gets close to your gun yeah. or else you've got too much in your vision. It's going to distract your eyes and you get bad information to your brain, which gives bad information to your hands and you can't move connected with the target. You'd mentioned that earlier, locking your eyes on the target. And I, and I wrote something down here is, and, and this is something, this is probably the one thing that Chad and I have not worked on a whole lot of is actually trusting your eyes. Does that make sense to you what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'll give you a quick scenario and everybody understand. I, I don't hold a fathom candle in the wind to the capability of these two. But like Chad wanted me to run 10 pairs the other day. It's it's a certain kind of training him and I are working on. And I get to about that fourth or fifth pair and it's like I'm doing all the moves correctly. But then all of a sudden it's almost like I wasn't believing what I was seeing. Does that make sense to you? And, and so it's trusting the eyes. So it, it's it's totally natural, and it, it's like second nature for everybody. Once you've done something, you want to look for that picture again. Right. Well, the problem is if you're looking at the picture, you're not looking at the target. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly what. Bingo. That's exactly Bingo. <laughs> nose touching the nose. Sorry, camera. Nose, nose, nose. And, and, and that, that to me is one of the, the biggest issues that – plagues most shooters is they try and recreate the picture but that first instinctive move with the target you're looking at the target and you're feeling everything else happen mm -hmm. well to recreate that you can't look at it and make it happen sean how many times when it, you know you think back 
four or five years ago when we were starting to shoot tournaments all the time. And it's been longer ago than that now. But anyway, how many times did did you step in the box and just completely just crush the first pair, and then the second pair you iced it? And yeah. you're like you're like I don't understand it. Looked the same. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what he was yeah. talking. It, yeah, we yeah. had to learn to get it, past that. Yeah. If it looks the same, it's probably not. If it feels right. It's probably right. I well, and you know, it's funny. I had a little different twist to that. Is if it looks the same, you're late, because basically by the time you try to see that same picture, you're, you're now you're taking that target way past. And there's a way. fine line to that for sure. I mean, you take yeah. a new shooter that I need them to see stuff like that because they're learning how to run the gun, or even a, a a decent middle line shooter. You know, Derek and I have been working on some stuff, so it will help with that kind of stuff. Talking about how to look at a target and stuff, but it is truly that it's like, I have all the skill in the world and I've been told by multiple coaches that, you know, my skills at a 12, but my, you know, my visual and mental is maybe not as good. Right. And why it's because I'm not looking at the target, you know, well, and, and, and what is it slowing it down? I, I, I've slowed down every target I've shot at, but I've never taken the shot when that happens. And that's when you're locked in. So <laughs> well, for, right? for, for me, like when I feel like I really see the target, I feel like time slows down. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I have all, even if it's a fast target, when I'm really connected to the target, I feel like time slows down and I have all the time in the world to get the right. gun where it needs to be. Yep. And that's, and that's the hardest part to get a student, especially a newer shooter to understand. Mm-hmm. Um, you, it, it's really hard to get someone to understand that, hey, when I'm locked in with this target, everything's slowing down, and it relaxes you. Yeah. When you don't get locked in with the target, your brain panics. And panic is ultimately what causes you to miss the target. Yeah, and you're completely disconnected at that mm-hmm. point. You're, you're not in rhythm. You're not in time. You know, I, you, I get you feel that. feel like it's getting away, and you yep. you end up shooting, and you're nowhere near the target. Yeah, you're blowing out in front of it, or you're way behind it, or whatever. But, yeah, yeah. When, I, when I feel most connected with a target, I feel almost like time's like a tunnel vision that's slowing down, and I'm just, I can just see it's like... D- d- but d- d- make just no mistake, moving. what Derek is talking about, because we had this conversation in the field the other day, <clears> or... <throat> quite a bit and it wasn't because i didn't understand them i wanted to understand what i'm hearing based on how i think about things right so this is not proprioception and never looking at the barrel and 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 not just looking at the target and drawing the line in your head and geometry and things like that this is not that this is you still see that but there is definitely a difference when you're connecting with the gun and the target and the eyes at the same time where when you go to go, like, you know, like Derek's like, get on that target and hold it until I say now. And we're talking 60-yard shots, you know, 70-yard shots. And now, and that you can feel the gun move and do what it has been trained to do because mm-hmm. I've been doing it for so long. The, the technique's already there. Yeah. This is the part where it's hard to quantify or talk about because everybody wants to chase a method. And they want to, I'm not shooting well, so this method's going to help me. Or, you know, and this is kind of like what Corey and I talked about that one time where he's like, you know, at, at our level, methods isn't really, I, you know, we, we've talked about this. We got video from the U.S. Open. There are people doing things that say they never start yeah. on the target and pull away. And I got video of them pulling away. And that was the person that won the shoot. And I have no idea if he even knows that he was pulling away and I got video proof that I slowed down. It's it's in the video. The, you guys can check it out. I'm standing nah. right behind him on top of a, 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 a igloo and you can see it. <laughs> well, it's funny you bring that up because that was actually going to be my, one of my next questions. Um, you know, let's talk about the U.S. Open for a minute, Derek. I mean, you were going right into the end there, tied with Wendell for the shoot off. Tell us kind of how what was going through your mind and how that was going for you at that point. You know, I it goes back out on the course. Um I was still coming off of last year having a, having kind of a struggle year shooting sporting clays. And I really didn't have that confidence that I could go get it done. Um, I think the U.S. Open has helped rekindle that fire. Um, but uh, it, I think it showed every day I failed to finish every day. I missed two targets on my last station the first day. I missed the one target I missed on Saturday was on my next to last station, a little 15 yard trap target. 
Oh. I know that's crazy coming from a guy that's been <laughs> shooting nothing but trap. Yeah. And then on Sunday, I missed three on the next to last station, two of which were a little 20 yard Shondell that is a target that I'd bet my life savings I could hit three out of three. And I think that goes back to not having that confidence to trust my abilities. And I tried to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough that Wendell missed the one on the last station to allow me the opportunity to run it and get in that shoot off. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately I couldn't carry it through into the shoot off. I, yeah. I missed one in the shoot off and got beat, you know, you that can't was your be a first target too, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't be upset about that. Like it, it just, my performance overall, I'm, I'm very happy with, I'm not happy that I didn't finish mm -hmm. any day, but given where I was, um, it's a huge step forward. Yeah. Um, for me personally. Um, but yeah, I, I had all the opportunity in the world to win that. And once again, I failed to win a U.S. Open. <laughs> well, you know, I asked Wendell this question uh, when we had him on the podcast because he's won several U.S. Opens, but the national championships kind of eluded him. You know, you've won the national championship twice. And but what is it? What What do you think there is to be that there seems to be like U.S. Open specialists and national specialists uh, it, uh, almost? You know what I mean? Team well, America. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I think with with the national championship, um, you know, you got everybody there. Yeah. Like there's always going to be that guy that's on fire. Um, you just, with 2000 shooters, there's going to be somebody on fire, right? It's going to happen. Somebody's going to get hot. Right? Yep. Yeah. And, and you, at the national championship, you always have a very similar style of targets and guys, there are guys that tend to do better on that style of target with the U S open. It moves all over the country and every part of the country has a different style of the game of sporting clays, mm -hmm. like Tucson's big open air, you know, stuff that, that lends itself to like Wendell's style of shooting. Right. Um, big air stuff is really more of a sustained lead. Yeah. Kind of style it, it's of really, really lends itself to that. Um, you know, you get in the woods, you know, maybe a little swing through works better in the Southeast in the woods. Um, you know, or you go to a place like Eminem, you get a little of both. You get mm -hmm. wide open. Um, you know, you go to Northbrook, you know, you're going to shoot a lot of speed. Um, people's games gravitate to the different styles of sporting clays sure. based on where they've lived their entire life. Right. And what they're used to. And what they're used to. Right. So I think that's why the U.S. Open is such a hard event to win because ultimately you've got to, um, you've got to be right for that style of the game that weekend. You know, growing up where I did, I don't know that we had a particular, you know, wide open big air. You know, we had a little bit of everything, but we never, we never shot a lot of distance, a lot of speed. So it was, it, I can't say that my game is built towards one style of the game. Right. Gotcha. And, and so to me, for the US Open purposes, I have to overcome that when I get to the club and figure out how I'm going to approach the game that weekend. Yeah. Um, to this be is successful. why guys, we always talk about studying where you're going to go. Mm -hmm. Look at who's setting the targets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys that are out there in shooter land and want to know how to, how to compete and you're a little bit weirded out by your first experience at Eminem or, you know, I knew I arrived back in the day. I remember talking to somebody and in my, I don't remember who it was. Um, but they're like, if you can shoot, an 89 at Anthony's and shoot an 89 at home and then go down to Texas and shoot an 89 and fly over to Florida and hit an 89. You are now starting to understand the different parts of the country that we shoot in and how the targets are. Yeah. And I think, I, I think the top guys, I, I always have believed this. I mean, the top guys plan better than the guys that don't aren't the top, right? You know, some people just go in, have a good time. They want to wing it and see what happens. But I think the guys that are truly there to, you know, that top 15 that can win at any time that we always talk about. Those are the guys that are planning for, you know, they got the experience years and years. I mean, how many years did you go to the nationals before you won your first one? 21. Yeah. So, I mean, that's 21 years, people. So, I mean, that's yeah. a long time. So, um, lots of experience, right? We can't teach it, but we can talk about it. 
um, you know, my experience here this week with Derek, you can't buy that. I'm sitting in a car with him 10 hours a day. Right. You know, the stuff we've talked about. Just ringing the sponge. You'll never get me to say it here. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's it's you just don't understand. You know? He doesn't realize I'm sending him down a huge rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Are you there, there, buddy? For the punchline at the end. <laughs> yeah. mm, well, right Chad, there. we got a lot of compliments. Uh, you were our, kind of our roving reporter at the U.S. Open, and, and a lot of good film and a lot of good documentary stuff going on there with all the shooters that you got to connect with. But tell us a little bit how your shooting went at the U.S. Open. Shot an 89% in the main, 89.9. I was 10 targets off the winners. Are you um, pretty comfortable with that kind of style of target I was, out there? You know, it's funny as I, I, I was consistent. That was my goal there is to be consistent through the mains. Um, I didn't really care about the side events, um, even though I try. You know, you always try, even though you, you, you say you won't, you will. But, uh, you know, you, uh, you got you to gotta think about how where you want to be at, at at an event and for me i had a really horrible jack links experience this year my my scores were way down from the year before the year before i i was average i averaged 94 percent and the winners averaged 96 this year um the average in the main event was 98 granted we had one more course mm -hmm. um and mine was 74 you know or something like that no 83 sorry um uh, I shot a 74% on one of the courses. That's what made it low. But it was like 83. So, and that's what I'm talking about. It was okay. one bad day, right? Yeah. So, um, it's hard to do these double, triple day. Um, oh, yeah. You know, to get it done. These guys are amazing. And, that, and I so, think that lends credit to like what Derek was saying. You know, the, the Nationals is a four day. Yep. And it opens a three yep. day. You know, that it's, kind of it, thing. There's one day things that, you know, I raced one day national championships. And if you're hot that day, you can win. I won one. And I got a gold medal in it. And it's it, it, if we had to do that over a five day period, it could be totally different. Yeah. Outcome. So um, awesome shooting. I did fine. Um, I had been out there a bunch. Um, I did some planning. You know, I was out there teaching multiple times before I got to shoot. So I really got used to the desert right. um, again because um, I hadn't been out there shooting much. Um, so yeah, just, just building the game. Um, it's coming, it's ebbing and flow, ebb and flow as they call it. Um, I think Derek's, he really kicked into something that I, he kicked in the door that I've been looking for. And, and because I didn't know it exactly, it, 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 it existed. didn't know what you were looking for. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> he, but he, back to the, but, he knew how to do it. Yeah. He just didn't know how to diagnose what he was struggling with. Right. And, you know, hopefully I was able to help him. Dude, it that. was, it was. Magical. Worth, it was magical. Sweet. Dude, you don't even the targets we were hitting yesterday and or when we were shooting, how far eighty we were. yard quartering away full spring midi Shondell. Hammering it. Ten times in a row. Hammering. Whoa. Totally different move. No calculations. None of the stuff that I teach because it was already there. Wow. If that makes sense. And you guys that do take lessons from me, what I teach you is I was doing all that stuff, but I didn't have to do it in the in the conscience standing there it was just connecting more of a feel type of thing yeah. but real quick i want to i want to say something real quick because i i got an opportunity with you guys to do that show um at the us open i do apologize derek i did film you in that i just didn't get to interview you i apologize I really I wanted you to because you were there. I, I left you out. I'm sorry. And we had so many. I got yelled at for having too many um people. But <laughs> no, I want to say job. it was awful that was so hard to do so if anybody ever decides to go down this path of doing a podcast oh you make millions and you're you, famous and dude <laughs> you're famous probably. can i film you <laughs> why do you want to film me because I, we're doing this podcast and you're just constantly and then mm -hmm. you know you get some guys like hell yeah let's do it you right, know? Um, right finding them getting people to send their their itinerary where they're at oh yeah you know i i interviewed Corey on his golf cart working on his golf cart because it was like there he is just hammered the brakes, slid sideways, came in hot. I'm like, we're doing the interview right now. I'm not <laughs> sure if I'm going to see you for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> and it was awful. That water truck driving by. You guys may have not seen it or heard it. I heard it. But Jules, I don't know if there was an app that could do that. <laughs> I didn't think there was. She made that sound way better well, than she's, it, it turned out. She's, because She does magical work on our podcast. I trust had... Me. I when I interviewed David, we were right in the because you got to get David when you're going to get David, right? And there was my students were, of mine were driving by in that gravel and they were trying to talk to him like get out of here. And I locked 
Clayton Nance inside of a, a four seater Polaris with all the windows rolled up and people look like, what are you guys doing in there? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, just to get good interviews. But the wind was so bad on the, on Saturday night when I interviewed, um, David, um, I got, I got Anthony when we we're sitting there watching the shoot offs against with Derek, you know, and you um, didn't hear anything and you, and she was able to cut all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was awful guys. I mean, it yeah. was, it was amazing how well that turned out and you're like, it's up. And I'm like, Oh God, I, this is going to be bad. And then, and then when it downloaded what it took all day to download that, that one day. Oh and I was like, God. this thing has got to be awful. If it's that long to, Oh, you're talking it, about the video, the video, YouTube, all the yeah, YouTube, went yeah. through YouTube and it turned out real. I mean, you're slow mo editing was your yeah skills are getting, i'm, I'm getting, getting better. on the video side of it if but, i can if i can get as good on the video side as jules is on the audio side <laughs> we'll we'd have some big we'll have thumbs something. up to her guys i mean we might get a real is, sporting clay show thing. yeah <laughs> she is wouldn't that be nice here yeah. here's i'm gonna compare it to somebody because uh, not a lot of people know this but jules is absolutely so awesome at that right I mean, she is just amazing. I mean, I don't think you guys be who you are without her, right? No, we would not. That man standing right, sitting right across from me, Derek, would not be the man he was or is without Diane. Sure. Yeah. Holy smokes. Dude, I'm surprised. I know I'm a fat kid, but holy hell. But see, this is why I get lessons for free from him. Because when he's when I send him out with a recorder, he knows I got to save money for the divorce attorney. <laughs> when she, when my wife takes the headphones off real slow like this and looks at me, it gives you the dirty and air, says, if, "If you ever hand me a file like this again, <laughs> I tried so, so hard, but no, literally, you did, you did a good job." The though. guys that the guys that do this, and I'm trying to do this as a living, you know, and I and I, you know, we all struggle with it, you know. I I still have my day job and stuff like that because of benefits. But you have to have a team at home. Oh, yeah. If you don't. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I would not want to be the person that doesn't have anything at home. And, you know, Jen's my rock. And Diana, holy smoke, she just holds down the fort with um, Riley. just awesome. She's my little buddy. And the dogs. And it's crazy. She, she and that woman can cook. Woo! You've told, I, me, I, you've told me this like four times now. I'm like. He Booking a flight to they had a, he like hasn't a, shut up about her brisket and mac and cheese. <laughs> I don't know what she did that mac and cheese, and but she's like, this is gonna, brisket. <laughs> it was it was twelve hours she smoked it. Wow. And then she made it the salad and we had, you know, Rick and and his mother over and I kept going back for more. It was awful. And you let me do it. <laughs> I wasn't gonna stop you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. So, All Derek, right. Derek um, I mean, you've always been a great performer when the heat's on, right? Um, Sometimes. And at the big money shoots. I mean, it seems like you're more consistent than most. So, like, think Dubai a couple years ago, right? I mean, a couple. Yeah. That was yeah. a few years ago. Yeah, a few years ago. It was ago. like 12 when that happened, dude. All right, so. <laughs> feels like it. <laughs> okay. <Yeah, right? laughs> well, cur currently, like, let's talk about Jack Links. They've upped their payout to $300,000 next year. I mean, do you think that's what the sport needs to help it grow or to bring more participants or, you know, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think, you know, our game's at a point where we need, we need interest. We need outside interest. Yeah. Um, and really the only way to do that is to, I feel like to shoot for bigger purses. Like the game is where the game is. And if you pay attention, the shoots that have bigger payouts are tending to draw bigger crowds like just look how fast the jack links filled up last year oh yeah i yeah. mean it, it it was yeah like within a week it was full oh yeah yeah you couldn't hardly get anything after a week yeah and so as much as the keyboard warriors want to complain about entry fees and money and that kind of stuff it attracts people mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um it, it really does and i think i think there's a way that we can get bigger purses at all our shoots that really wouldn't strain the economics of the, of the sport. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're traveling to a shoot, you're spending four or $5,000 mm -hmm. pretty easy right. to go to the U S open. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's pretty easy. You're going to spend 800 bucks on a plane ticket. You're going to spend two grand in entry fees. You're going to spend, Rental Two car, grand, golf yeah, car, you, hotel room. You know, you're yeah. you're in it for five thousand right. dollars. If you were to have, um, my buddy Gary had a brilliant idea the other day. Um, 
you know, he put out as a hypothetical on one of the social media pages about a one dollar per hundred that goes into a straight pot. Yeah. Well, you take like the national championship, the Creek Golf Cup. If you, everybody put one dollar out of their entry fee into a straight pot. That target that that event gets run once every five to eight years. Well, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars. I think he figured up it was going to be like fifty six thousand if someone were to run it next year, since the last time it had been run. If we'd been doing a one dollar per entry into wow. that pot. Well, and you know Tony Rivera talked about that. Yeah, he's like, you know, what's a hundred dollars more? But if everybody that competed in the national championship put in an extra hundred bucks, it was like four hundred thousand yeah. dollar purse. Uh, like. I don't see any reason why you take our championship tour events. Why are the entry fees not doubled with half of that going back to class? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got, if you've got a hundred people in E class and they all put $200 into the pot and you pay out one place for every five shooters, yeah. 20% of your entries are getting a good paycheck. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. They're going to pay for, for at least all their entries, if not most of their trips. Well, you know, I was always a big proponent of bringing in an outside sponsorship or, you know, you think like monster energy or something like that. Now, judging by his latest vest design, Bud Light might pick up David Radulovich, but um, it's going to have to come from with. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, that <laughs> that was, just hit me he, like he a, said that. That just that, hit me like a light bulb. <laughs> wait, was that out loud? Uh, yeah, you, <laughs> you guys didn't see Chad's last vest. Oh, come on. Oh, now. my goodness. Yeah, what's up, Budweiser? Uh, anyway. He's more of a Michelob. He's <laughs> more of a Michelob. At least it's a subsidiary. <laughs> 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 but no, I, I mean, I think the problem is we're shooting guns. It's got to, it's got to be built from the inside out. Look, man, I, yeah. I, I, I have friends that started the PBR, and yeah, they had tons of outside sponsors. But you know how they got there? They did it themselves. They did it from within. They did. Right. They all put in ten thousand dollars, all the top uh, riders, and then they built a game where entry fees were high, payouts were high. Yeah, more entry fees. Well, more people I think built that, a tour. Then I, I you, think that Derek's point and Gary's idea or Tony Tony Rivera's idea of let's throw in a look. Look, you're already spending all this money to be there. Let's throw in just a little bit more well, and we can have I huge think, purses. I think the hardest part for me as a competitor, because I raced, you know, I was a racer, BMX racer, and I, you know, made good money doing that, is I always I always had the people that complained that their entry fees were so high at these big national events. I'm like, dude, you're at the one day national championships or you're at the, you're at the East coast nationals racing are here. I raced, you know, in Ohio, I won, I won in Columbus, the Christmas classic every year, you know, started the day after Christmas, who wants to go travel to a BMX race the day after Christmas, right? With their family, 4,000 riders did. Wow. You know why? Cause the purses were huge. We could make money, you know, and it was just what we did. And it's like, if you guys, Shooterland people, and I'm sorry if I offend any of you guys, if you're going to shoot tournaments, that's what it's about. It's not about just ha just hanging out with your friends. That's just such a small part of it. We're competing. It, it, you, go, you go to the Olympics, you're competing not to hang out with your buddies, guys. Right. Right. So, so one thing that I've always had an issue with is there's a, a group of people that compete that they're more than willing to go shoot for somebody else's money, but yeah. they won't go shoot. They won't put up their own money to go shoot for it. Right. And I've always had an issue with that. Yeah. You know, they, and they're some of the first people to complain that their purses are too small. Well, if you're not willing to bet on yourself, are you really a competitor? Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, I don't I, win I, anything that's, guys that's, and I'll do it. That's very harsh. I realize that. And I don't, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm just out here trying to pad my own. No, wallet. no, no, no. Um, I, I really want to help grow the game. And I, I think the only way we're going to attract any kind of sort of outside the industry of the shooting sports is to have those bigger purses. It makes us and, bigger. And, you know, golf, golf started that way. The PBR started. It, fishing started that way. Yes. Yep. Yep. You know, you had... They they built their purses out of their own entry fees first, and that attracted the outside sponsors. If you, you know, when the Jack Links gets to a point where the winner's taking home fifty grand, you can't tell me that Johnny Morris isn't going to jump on. Yeah, you know, maybe not Johnny, but you know, somebody in the industry involved in the outdoors world somewhere will jump on yeah. with Troy and and help. Build that purse. The NSCR, NSCA has already done that. 
they already raised the the output of money they're giving for the you know but why because yeah. of people were migrating to the bigger shoots and it and it is dwarfing them yeah, yeah. They, you know, so the the only issue i have with way the nsca is doing it at nationals is yeah they doubled the money that goes to champion runner up in third well the guy that finishes fourth place at nationals shot better than 1996 other competitors yeah you know he really shot well right and he doesn't get anything for it yeah. well you know I and mean, i think i think there's a problem with that oh absolutely i agree absolutely I agree. you know if you look at the if you look at the class the class structure the whole mass class thing we're not even going to go there but the one of the biggest classes at nationals is masters it was, i think there was over 700 yeah last year okay but there's still out of 700 so that's 700 and some change there's still 13 1400 other competitors right and if they're going to go there and pay all that money what what's putting up a little tiny bit more to get them some money for their yeah. classes you know like i then, i think you could if you had a $200 back to class mandatory purse for everybody, you could almost eliminate the options. Yeah. And yeah. essentially by doing that, you're making the shoot cheaper because people aren't playing the options and can still win money. Absolutely. You know, if, if you're playing this game, $200 more at the national championship is not, not going to break you. And it's if it nothing. does, you probably shouldn't be, Playing the game a lot, yeah, or just stay local, yeah, <laughs> stay local, yeah, build your local community. Um, Sean has a new color, and it's got the new FX stock on it. And I, I got a big education this week between the FX stock and the F one stock. Um, but you were very interested. It was basically your that FX stock was your design. Talk about how that came about. I think this is really cool. So I, you know, the the F one was kind of the start. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't come out quite as well as I had hoped. You know, I, I worked with the guys at Elite, and we we put together that stock, and it it was okay, mm -hmm. um, but it needed needed some improvement. Um, and the FX is the fruition of those efforts to improve that stock. And we were going for a stock that just felt good in the hands. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's not going to fit everybody. Our old stock's going to fit some people better than the FX does. But I feel like the FX was geared towards a broader range of shooters that it was going to be comfortable for. Right. Well, the four of us sitting here in the studio have kind of a similar hand structure, and that palm swell is amazing. On the first time I grabbed his gun, I looked at Brian Palmer, and I'm like, get me a stock. And he's like, this, you know, the wood on my gun is beautiful. That's the problem. It's like replacing that with an FX stock that looks that good is my wife. Here we go with the divorce fund again. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I told him, I said, I the way that thing feels in the hand. And that's something, too, that I've had a lot of conversations with Chad and uh, Ricky Marshall Jr. Um, is trigger placement with the with the index finger. You know, if, you're, if your hand is more rotated, uh, and I'm, I'm telling this to an expert. <laughs> if your hand's more rotated up, that's Keep where... Keep going. This is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. So, but I was getting a lot of flinches because yeah. I was putting the three and a half, four pounds of pull and the gun wasn't going off, right? But as the hand rotated down more and more in line with the trigger, all that went away. So Chad's got me hanging my pinky finger off the bottom. So I'm actually holding the gun like that. And... But with that FX stock, I don't have, it's it's a no-brainer. It's automatically, it's right there. It fits. Well, look, I mean, Derek shot a blazer before all this stuff back in the old days. And when I got on the team, he was the one that actually, the setup I have on my gun is Derek's. From him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's He knows, I, I didn't realize how much how many tools he had in his garage that he can work on his own stuff with the Krylon cans and the sandpaper. <laughs> the little the little cool tools that he can make. He's got look, the little MacGyver shop it, going he on. He makes it look like it's been professionally done. I never knew he could do that. I didn't know you were that skilled. I'm not that skilled. It, well, <laughs> I just got really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you, you put enough spit and elbow grease, anything can look okay. Uh, well, I've tried with Sean, it just doesn't work. Um, well, <laughs> wow. <no. laughs> I'm dropping all kind of bombs here. Once, once it's again, morning time. Once yeah. again, the love shows. Yeah. Uh, we had Ricky Marshall Jr. on the show a while back, and you know we 
a lot of people call him the Derek Mine of trap uh, because he competes and everything people like you. People are do. equating people to me. I, Ricky's been shooting for like twice as long as I have. I, well, I'm, I'm the one that originally dubbed that. He because, did. Okay, like, it was funny. You because did. he competes in trap, skeet, sporting, you know, the whole nine yards. And you compete in trap, skeet, sporting, and you bunker. And so that's why I came up with well, that. So the question is, with all the different disciplines you shoot, is there one win or one defining moment that you think kind of stands above everything else for you? The world championship. The world championship is the one. That, that that is the hardest event with a shotgun you could ever win. Really? Because everybody that's there competing has earned the right to represent their country to be there. Mm-hmm. So they are there to do one thing. They are there to break targets and win that event. They're the elite of the elite. That that it is it is like taking the guys that were always in the shoot off for the PSCA. Mm-hmm. But taking that group from every country, wow, that's cool. You know, if it, you could you could equate it to taking the top two or three from every state in the U.S., the best two or three shooters from every state, and that is the totality of the group that's competing, and they're trying to win the national championship. The dead pair. Hey, we ran a little long this week. We'll be happy to see you next week. We'll see you next time on the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by Elite Shotguns and Vero Beach Clay Shooting and is fueled by Fioki USA. The Dead Pair theme song was written, arranged, and produced by Toby Tomplay. Special thanks to the following sponsors. Bear Pelt, Rhino, Odo Pro, Don Grant, Atlas Trap Company, RE Ranger, and White Flyer Targets. 